Uh, okay. Okay, yeah. Let me let me do that. Okay. Aloha mai kako or Adam is your ko inoa no ke apua o kahalu i ka mokupuni o ahu. Hi, I'm Adam Miyashiro. I just wanted to introduce myself in Olala Hawaii, Hawaiian language, because also my hoa aina here, uh, lehua, is also going to do that in the next one. So I wanted to sort of try it out. I'm only learning Hawaiian. I'm only like a second year. Um, I would like to begin by stating my gratitude as a settler of color to the uh, Akimel Otham and Peeposh nations on whose beautiful lands we occupy in this university and community. <clears throat> I would also like to thank the Center, uh, Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies and Ayanna Thompson and Jeffrey Jerome Cohen for inviting me and other fellow pre-modern scholars to participate in the symposium. When I was first asked to be on this program with the theme of appropriation, my immediate thought uh, ran to topics familiar on a personal level. The appropriation of oceanic food and culture, for example, like weird ass poke bowls <laughs> that I don't recognize at all from my youth, uh, and Halloween costumes, and uh, Coachella, I don't know. Uh, and how also cultural appropriation isn't reserved for just white people, but plenty of black and other people of color can also participate in black fishing or yellow face. As I thought more carefully about the idea of appropriation though, and how it could be more applicable to the study of pre-modern race, my mind turned to the various kinds of appropriations of crusade and crusader imagery commonly associated with white supremacist groups, such as the Proud Boys, the group formerly known as Identity Europa, which is now called the American Identity Movement or something, the National Socialist Movement, which is the rebranded American Nazi Party, and particularly how Islam and Muslims are centered as one of the points of white supremacist uh, hatred. So, <clears throat> The Crusades is the name we've given to a series of European Christian military incursions into Western Asia in the 11th, and 13th the 11th through 13th centuries, specifically in the part of the Arab world known as Bilad al-Shams, sometimes rendered as the Levant, thoroughly encompassing the contemporary areas of, <clears throat> or roughly encompassing the contemporary areas of southern Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, and Palestine and Israel. My aim in this talk is not to examine the historical, social, economic, or religious contours of these military incursions, but rather to interrogate how crusade scholarship uh, and popular thought in the past half century have been appropriated <clears throat> uh, to think through contemporary colonialism in modern Palestine and Syria. Secondly, I want to explore how crusades appropriation trades and racial capitalist formations and intersects with settler colonial states to produce the erasure of colonial victims, such as Palestinians and other Muslims who suffer at the hands of Western military regimes and settler violence. <clears throat> First, however, I would like to walk through some of my key terms and ideas so that I can define them so that we can probably have a, a good conversation. The first one is Islamophobia, which conveniently describes the kinds of racism that's directed against Muslims from Asian and African countries. <clears throat> Islamophobia is a flimsy and inaccurate term in many ways, chiefly because it do, it's not really a phobia or fear, but rather a, sy a systemic and institutional marshalling of political resources to oppress communities both domestically and internationally. Islamophobia is racialized violence on a mass scale with broad political and institutional support that takes international dimensions. <clears throat> uh, for example, U.S. foreign policy in the Af Afro-Asian world, Indian policies towards Kashmir and Indian Muslims under Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Myanmar's persecution of Rohingya Muslims from Rakhine State, and the Israeli blockade of Gaza and the occupation of Palestinians in the West Bank are among the most notable examples of how Christian, Jewish, Hindu, and Buddhist nationalisms have allied in anti-Muslim governmental policies in recent years. <clears throat> the second term here is settler colonialism, 
which continuously per perpetuates genocide and repression of indigenous people on lands with which they share some form of genealogical connection. Um, as a lot of people like to say, uh, colonialism is not an event, but a structure, right? Settler colonialism is not an event, but a structure, it's ongoing. <clears throat> Uh, this is contrasted with classical colonialism, something we might see in British colonial India, for example, or Belgian colonization of the Congo, which were imperial colonial projects, but did not replace or intend to replace the inner, original inhabitants of the land. The third term is apartheid, which is the legal social separation of South Africans by race um, that is commonly now to apply to the situation Palestinians face in occupied Palestinians, <coughs> uh, occupied Palestine in the last 70 years. The fourth term is Zionism, which is a secular political movement began in the 19th century for European Jews to emigrate from Europe to the historical region of Palestine. Although it was a secular European nationalist movement, it also had religious connotations and rationales that were influenced by historical European anti-Jewish racism. In the UN-sponsored World Conference Against Racism in Durban, South Africa in 2001, Zionism was labeled as racism because it privileges one ethno-religious group over another in the whole of historic Palestine. The final term I bring up <clears throat> is racial capitalism. It was first proposed by Cedric Robinson in Black Marxism and later expanded on by Chand and Reddy and uh, Jody Melamed, among others. Racial capitalism is, according to Nancy Leon, quote, the economic and social value derived from an individual's racial identity. I think I need the next one here. Um, <clears throat> the economic and social de value derived from an individual's racial identity, whether by that individual or by other individuals or by institutions, end quote. Jody Melamed goes further uh, to say that, quote, we often associate racial capitalism with the central features of white supremacist capitalist development, including slavery, colonialism, genocide, incarceration regime, regimes, migrant exploitation, and contemporary racial warfare. Yet we also increasingly recognize that contemporary racial capitalism deploys liberal and multicultural terms of inclusion to value and devalue forms of humanity differentially to fit the needs of the reigning state capital orders, end quote. Thus, cultural appropriation fits in the determining status of how non-whiteness can produce value for the dominant culture. And it is through white institutions that determine the value of non-whiteness. The per surplus value created in the racial marketplace of capitalism also creates surplus violence, as Jody Melamed explains, quote, the term racial cruelty signifies the extreme or surplus violence alongside and within state practices of supposedly rational violence, military, security, and legal, through which the state establishes itself <clears throat> at once the protector of freedom and an effective because excessive counterviolence to the violence of race." End quote. Between the social and economic currency gained in racial capitalist formations comes what uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore terms anti-relationality, or the breaking of human bonds that is necessary in capitalist assemblages. It is through these processes of how non-white bodies become viewed as reducible in relational value. That is, those bodies are more worthless than the white bodies which trade off the value produced. This is one definition of racism that seeks to account for the in institutional devaluing of non-white, non-Christian life that might be able to give shape to constructing pre-modern critical race theory. The devaluing of Muslim life that occurs in medieval literary texts and the Romance traditions are glaring reminders that in the Western European view, Muslim bodies were objects upon which racial cruelty was practiced. Medieval chansons de geste, like the Chanson Roland, or the Song of Roland, and romances such as Guy of Warwick, revel in the destruction and erasure of Muslim bodies, as pointed out by Shokufe uh, Rajabzadeh last week at MLA, and in her recent article in Literature Compass. Her article also makes an important intervention for dropping the use of the term Saracen from our scholarship and replacing it with Muslim, 
which works to value the lives which are being discussed in the context of both medieval and contemporary mass violence. In a similar vein, historians frequently use the term Holy Land to describe what is considered in Arabic by the Umayyad and the Abbasids as Jun Philistine, the district of Palestine, and, and Suriya He Pal Palestina in the historic region of greater Syria by the Byzantines. This region was called Palestina or Palestine by virtually every political power who ruled over it for centuries until the more recent modernity. As Edward Said notes in his essay, Zionism from the standpoint of its victims, quote, Palestine is a place of causes and pilgrimages. It was the prize of the Crusades, uh, as well as the place whose very name and endless historical naming and renaming of the place has been an issue of doctrinal importance. <clears throat> To call the place Palestine and not Israel or Zion is already an act of fairly consequential political interpretation. The truth uh, is, of course, that if one were to read geographers, historians, philosophers, and poets who wrote in Arabic from the ninth century on, one would find innumerable references to Palestine, to say nothing of innumerable references to Palestine in European literature from the Middle Ages to the present, end quote. So the Eurocentric and Christian-centric nomenclature for the geographical region where the Crusades took place as the Levant, from the French word to rise as in the sun, and the Holy Land, uh, which is specifically mythologized as a non-political and amorphous topography, suggests that the geographic territory is one that is non-distinct. Um, 15th century Arabic writers also use the term al-ard uh, uh, of the Holy Land uh, to describe the region interchangeably with, um, with Palestine. Along with the Iberian term Reconquista or Reconquest, Crusade historiography tended to see the regions invaded by European Christians as a return or restoration of Christian rule over what was ostensibly lost to Arab Muslim governance. But more recently, uh, scholarship has tended to challenge these assertions about religious land claims, specifically in Iberia, where Christianity continued under Arab Muslim rule and was never eliminated. Likewise, Crusader rulers of Jerusalem refused papal authority and claims to ownership of cru Crusader-held lands, so the idea of Roman Christian unity in cru uh, Crusader Palestine had been thoroughly debunked in contemporary historiography. Well, sorry, I missed a slide here. That's the quote from Jody Malamed about racial capitalism. Um, <clears throat> following the 1948 Palestinian Nakba, or a catastrophe, in the establishment of the Israeli state, historians began to compare the history of recent events with the Crusades. Uh, Charles Isawi, the Egyptian historian of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University, wrote in 1957 of the parallels between the Crusades and the Zionist Project of Israel. Quote, both the Crusades and Zionism drew their original impetus from a yearning for Jerusalem, and both resulted in the establishment of a state in Palestine. Both intrusions were successful mainly because of the great disunity among the numerous Arab states in Egypt and Syria, more than offset their numerical superiority." End quote. However, Isawi cautioned against taking these parallelisms as too predictive, but he does suggest that they are helpful in understanding Western attitudes toward people of the region. Quote, if history does have any meaning, the existence of such close parallelisms cannot be without significance for an understanding of present moods and attitudes in the Near East, end quote. Many historians made use of the Crusades in attempting to parse out the relationship between medieval path, the medieval past and contemporary present. The Pan-Arabist project led by Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser uh, constructed the Crusades as an example of how European colonial projects will ultimately fail, as Yusuf Shaheen's 1963 film Salhadin uh, makes clear through the love affair between the French crusader woman Louisa, who is courted by an Arab Christian general Isa in Salhadin's army. In the film, Isa and Louisa are split between crusader and Arab rule over Jerusalem and suggest peace can come about if the crusaders accept Arabs as equals. This view of Arab and European inequality was buttressed by historians such as the Israeli crusade historian Joshua Prower, whose book, The Crusader's Kingdom, European Colonialism in the Middle Ages, published in 1972, unequivocally stated that the Crusader Kingdom was an example of apartheid. 
In Prowers' words, quote, non-integration, or more exactly apartheid, had deep-reaching influences and not merely in the social and political domain where it was specifically envisaged. It was also if, uh, reflected in a particular attitude, a mental disposition to erect barriers, even in spheres where proximity created contacts and coexistence exerted mutual influence, end quote. Prower argues that the Crusades, specifically the First Crusade, was an act of European colonial expansion, the transplanting of a medieval European culture into the Eastern Mediterranean. However, he then goes on to explain that from the Christian perspective, in a bizarre twist, it was, quote, an act of decolonization, end quote. Like the Reconquista, and like the two other states that arose from former Muslim uh, governed territories in Sicily and Spain, the Crusades were viewed as a liberation from Muslim rule. Uh, Yuri Avnery, an Israeli reporter and commentator, also stated his equation of Zionism with European Crusader ideology in his book, Israel Without Zionism. But many other historians have challenged these parallels. Uh, William Oxenwald, uh, writing in Middle East Journal in 1976, cautions against taking easy comparisons without looking at significant differences, such as the modern United Nations, the nation state structure, and the rapidity of political decision making. Some of their criticisms, such as the idea that contemporary politics shouldn't inform historical interpretation of the Crusades, have also been challenged by the fact that political leaders have been using Crusade rhetoric in describing or characterizing foreign policy in the Arab world and in Western Asia. Um, so uh, George W. Bush famously said after the invasion of Iraq that, quote, this crusade, this war on terrorism, is going to take a while. All right, we, we never know how long that is. And even more recently, as Matthew Gabrielle and David Perry have written about, uh, Donald Trump Jr. posted a selfie on Instagram with a crusader assault rifle pictured here. <clears throat> we should not be surprised by this, in fact. Um, this is not, to me, really that surprising. The normalization of crusade imagery associated with the U.S. military and the so-called war on terror began almost 20 years ago and has continued unabated. Uh, in 2015, the U.S. Army base at Fort Shafter in Oahu, uh, near Moanalua, was shown uh, with a crusading knight at the war, quote-unquote warrior training center with explicitly Christian imagery. Um, <clears throat> you know, like, if you spend a lot of time around military, you get a lot of these crusader-type imagery, like, let's go kill Muslims, let's go kill Muslims. Um, and it's totally normalized, right? Like, look at this. And in fact, it was actually like um, uh, complaints from non-Christian members of the military who were like, you know, this is like sectarian Christian um, uh, imagery. But compare this image here to what you see later on with these Deus Volt memes, right? Um, because that's essentially how they parlay into the far right. So it starts out as ordinary, normalized um, Islamophobia in the U.S. military, um, which I don't think is that normal, but um, it goes into these uh, Deus Volt type of memes. Um, they like to portray these Crusader Knights as like anti-Muslim uh, figures. By the way, like there's a weird backstory behind one of these memes. Like um, <clears throat> at an anti-Islam rally in New York, um, there were three Egyptian uh, Coptic Christians there who were vehement anti-Muslims and called their friends on the phone Arabic, in Arabic and said, hey, come down here in Arabic. And they got accosted by the group thinking that because they spoke Arabic, they were Muslim. Because in the U.S., right, anything Arabic is Muslim. And so there's no real differentiation between, you know, sect. And these Egyptians were like, hey, man, we're with you, you know. They're like, you're not, you know, and like... That's the big surprise. Um, so if you hear someone speaking Arabic downstairs, whatever that means. Um, in 2016, a Scottish mosque was vandalized using the phrase disvolt and uh, calling it Muslim worshiper Saracen. I mean, like this is in 2016, December, right? So. Um, and of course, in 2017, and this is why I think like a lot of these things come together here, Canadian far-right white nationalist journalists Faith Goldie and Gavin McInnes 
who is the co-founder of Vice News, but even though he's not associated with them anymore, and he's a, the founder of Proud Boys, the far-right organization. He's a Canadian. Um, Proud Boys, if you don't know this, have a very bizarre history um, of being closely tied to the military, um, disrupting in, both in Canada and the U.S., disrupting Native um, people's ceremonies. But the, 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 the most interesting thing about the Proud Boys to me is that they took their name from the Broadway version of the Disney movie Aladdin, where there's a song called Be Proud of Your Boy. And so they drew their name from this Disney song. I don't know. I, I, like, don't ask. Um, <clears throat> but here they are actually uh, in Bethlehem in occupied Palestine. And they commented, Faith Goldie is commenting in this video about how the Muezzin's call to prayer from the mosque that's next to the Church of the Nativity was defiling Christianity. And they collectively call on Western Christians to wage a crusade to liberate Bethlehem from Muslims. Of course, the 70-plus Israeli checkpoints, the apartheid wall that cuts off Bethlehem from its neighbors, the nine Israeli settlements that surround Bethlehem are unremarkable for these white supremacists because settler colonialism is rather invisible in settler states like the US, Canada, and Israel, Australia, and New Zealand, too. The confluence of militarism, settler colonialism, and by the way, I have a map here of, this is an old map, too, but this is, uh, this is what Bethlehem looks like in terms of the settlements and the checkpoints. Um, <clears throat> the confluence of militarism, settler colonialism, and the devaluation of Palestinian life can be seen in the most recent Israeli military assaults on Gaza. Um, I'm, the trigger warning here, this is like a lot of violent uh, imagery, even though it's not actual, it's, you know, symbolic uh, imagery. Um, a t-shirt sold after the assault on Gaza in 2009 shows a pregnant Palestinian woman with a cr within the crosshairs of a rifle sight holding an AK-47 with the words, one shot, two kills. Uh, that was being sold uh, among the Israeli Defense Forces. Another t-shirt shows a child, another t-shirt that I'm not picturing here shows a child in the sights with the words, the smaller they are, the harder it is. <clears throat> And um, to talk about, you know, to bring it back to sort of racial capitalism here, um, in the 2014 assault um, of Gaza, which killed more than 2,000 Palestinians, including 500 children, Israeli teenagers posted selfies stating that, uh, and this is in Hebrew, hating Arabs isn't racism, it's values. Uh, so when you talk about like social capital um, on social media, um, these, uh, these kind of selfies that were posted were actually kind of viral. So to return to the point of racial capitalism and appropriation, I want to make two uh, sort of assertions here. First, that appropriation can be cultural appropriation as we see it operating, but appropriation of land and resources under settler colonialism is attended by the devaluation of life through violent forces. Second, that the modern appropriations of the Crusades by historians, politicians, and media figures feed the policy formations that appropriate and expropriate lives and lands and devalue Arab Muslim life. In this way, the modern appropriations of Crusades marshal racial capitalist myths about medieval Europeans and Muslims, Arabs, and Palestinians, and there are, they aren't just far-right fringe groups doing this, right? But it's mainstream and it's codified in our laws, our governmental policies, and our foreign policy decisions. So the questions I end with oops, are, <clears throat> how does racial capitalism operate in other areas of racism, white supremacy, and medieval studies? That's a question that came up last week in, at MLA in Seattle. How do we recognize the normal, normalized violence toward people of color, both here and abroad, to add to our understanding of racial cruelty? And how does this change the way we might teach canonical medieval texts and the fantasy genres that center violence? Thank you for hearing me.
Adam, uh, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, fascinating talk. Um, I'd like to try to give you what I'm attempting as a response to the second two questions you have. Um, and then since you obviously have much more experience than I do, get your take on, you know, if you try similar things, what results you found, et cetera. So um, regarding like the normalized violence towards people of color, as you um, stressed in this talk, it comes down to dehumanizing us. Um, it was actually uh, recently, we may have seen a, a video going viral of a man in Iraq saying, are we not human? Uh, and I think it's important that we really double down. I mean, like, it's, it sounds ridiculous to say it, but yes, we are human and we need to really challenge anything that puts that away. So one way that the, my teaching of texts um, tries to change that is by decentering um, European perspectives, um, Western ideas. Obviously, that is my specialty. I specialize in uh, medieval uh, English and Scandinavian literature. But rather than just allow those perspectives to stand alone in the class, I'm trying to, you know, if I'm gonna touch on something, an English text that deals with quote unquote Saracens, I also want an Arabic text or, um, a, you know, just a, a text from a Muslim perspective that I can put alongside that so that there is an immediate challenge, there is an immediate perspective from the other side that can hopefully counterbalance the European view. And I was just wondering, you know, have you found some, you know, what reactions have you found from students when presenting texts in, in such a manner? Well, I mean, there, <clears throat> I teach a course called Comparative Medieval Literature in which, you know, depending on when I, like, depending on how I structure it, I almost always put in the Thousand and One Nights, like the Norton translation of the 14th century manuscript. And <clears throat> my students are, first of all, they love it. It's like really raunchy and like they, they it's fun and it, it sucks you in. Um, they like the text on that level. And then they don't actually pay attention because they think they're gonna get like Aladdin or something, I don't know. Um, they think they're gonna get a Disney-fied version of it, but they don't get that. But then they're not also paying attention to a lot of the other things. Like one of the things I really like to look at in that text is um, the idea of marketplace and, and the globality within the marketplace is this whole shopping scene, right? Where um, the woman goes out shopping and there's all of these things in the marketplace from all over the world, including Europe um, in this you know, market in Baghdad. Um, but then when we turn to medieval Europe, they see then that these cultures that are actually, they're like reading deeply into a little bit, they see that they're completely not understood by European perspectives. So when they see um, the kind of like wanton violence, they're actually turned off by it after. And, and then in fact, like, you know, that's actually the, the benefit of teaching these texts alongside each other, right? Um, that, that you can gain a different perspective. Like if you're, gonna, if you're just gonna read medieval European literary texts um, that, that you know, discuss otherness, um, they will find um, a lot of violence being centered. The other, the other really cool thing that I've done is, and I really love this text, is the medieval Alexander romance, right? Like, and not necessarily just a Middle English one, but I did do a, a, scene, a seminar with a few students where we read the ancient uh, Greek uh, romance, Alexander romance, and then we collectively read the Middle English King Alexander. And what they found was that you know, first of all, um, the ideas about Persian culture, uh, the way that Alexander and his men, or Alexander ordered his men to adapt Persian culture weren't necessarily always in that uh, King Alexander, but then there was a lot of crusader imagery, just like, you know, heavy-handed crusade imagery, just like put, put into the Middle English romance. So they see that the text, the text network can move between different places, but they're not always, a, it's not always the same text, right? Like people are gonna imbue um, their own um, particular cultural values uh, into the versions of these texts. So I think um, reading Arabic literature, I think reading um, uh, South Asian literary texts actually gives a good counterpoint to medieval Europe that, you know, this is not the only way that uh, pre-modern 
literary narratives needed to work, right? Hi. Sorry. Here. Hi. <laughs> um, I think you bring up a really um, powerful point about sometimes it's the order that we teach things so that if we are prefacing European medieval texts and starting off with them, they, uh, students will see this as the onset point. This is where we're beginning. And, they, and then that becomes kind of coincides with a sense of authority. And I think that that kind of displacing that, decentering, I think it was Eduardo that, that said that. This is also uh, incredibly significant when we're teaching because it's not as if you're going to simply ignore these texts because students will find them anyway. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's, it's like the difference between reading Sarah Ahmed and then reading Kant. Then you're, you're viewing Kant in a completely different way than you would have previously. Um, but the, the other, the point that I, I wanted to kind of, or kind of question bring into this was kind of this concept of Islamophobia and the connection to the black power movements in the 1960s of where, particularly in America, there has been this anti-Muslim yeah, undercurrent that's been there, that has been attempted to be squashed. We can view it from a very racial aspect, but you know, it's very difficult to disengage thinking about Malcolm X with, with uh, uh, Islam. You know, mm -hmm. you, you can't, and it, he's obviously not the only one. I mean, there, there are many figures. Um, but I think that's also something that as we're factoring in, which then kind of brings this weird kind of both a European context of being um, anti-Islamic and anti-Semitism combined also with a specifically kind of American, not uniquely, but specifically American aspect of racial hatred. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like it's bundled into one, which makes it very convenient. And I'm kind of wondering if you have any thoughts about that in terms of bringing that into kind of a modernized medieval crusader narrative. Well, I mean, you know, Mo, like, and we have crusade historians in the room, like, that totally will, like, say this as well, right? That historic um, anti-Semitism and historic anti-Muslim uh, sentiment came up around the same time, right? Um, during, the, during the early crusading era. And um, so they've always been linked. And I think that if you study contempt, like, you know, the, actually the, the really good book, um, well, two good books that came out um, more recently it was Deepa Kumar's book on Islamophobia, which the, it's um, Islamophobia and the Politics of Empire, which I think is a fantastic book because, you know, sometimes like, again, just like with racism, um, uh, anti-racist discourses sometimes, uh, you know, tend to be about, oh, it's just, it's personal feelings, right? Like, or, you know, if, if we just talk to them, you know, they'll understand, right? The, the, the Derek Black uh, narrative, right? Like, let's be friends with the white supremacists and then they'll, they'll learn to love us. But instead of that, like, let's take a look at the structural institutional background, right? Like, just like when we have like Black Lives Matter, right? Like when, when those, you know, white people call the police on, um, you know, the graduate student who was sleeping in the, in the room, do you remember that, just like a couple of years ago? So one graduate, a white woman graduate student called the cops on a black graduate student uh, woman who was taking a nap, and the cops came, and because it was on social media, now she's like suing, the, the white woman is suing the, the, the university for ruining her career or something. Anyways, the point is that when a white person calls a uh, cops on a black person, and by the way, I've had cops call on me too, so I know what that's like. Um, there's an institutional force behind that, right? It's not just willy-nilly. But it's the same thing with anti-Muslim uh, sentiment in this country, in Europe, um, because it's backed up, right? Um, people, and people see it, um, they don't respond. Um, police generally probably are not even all that interested in protecting Muslim communities themselves, right? In fact, NYPD was spying on Muslim groups in my, the city I live in, in Philadelphia, right? Like, I don't know how the NYPD sent people to Philadelphia to spy on MSA groups at Temple University and UPenn. 
like what jurisdiction do they have doing that? But in any case, that's how, that's how militarized our police is in this so-called war on terror, right? They've been deputized as policing Muslim communities. And by the way, one of them, one of the undercover cops for the NYPD like infiltrated the MSA, you know? And then they went on a kayaking tour. And then um, he got like, he wrote up this report about what the Muslims did and he got it all wrong. He was like, they prayed four times a day and all kinds of stuff. And so they don't even do their jobs. Like these are deputized, you know, police, they're, they're police officers who were gone out to spy outside of their city. And so that's where it is. And, and by the way, that's why um, black to Palestine, um, Ferguson to Palestine emerged, right? Because when police were tear gassing and shooting rubber bullets at black people in Ferguson, who was the people who were telling them how to deal with that? Palestinians in the West Bank who face that like every day. The same tear gas canisters are shot at Palestinians of West Bank, shot at the Egyptian protesters in 2011, right? Like we are the weapons manufacturer. We, we export these things. There is like a global trade in rubber bullets and tear gas canisters. So the Ferguson activists were like, we don't have any allies in this country, but here's our allies in, in the West Bank and in Gaza. They're like telling us how to treat um, uh, uh, the wounds or, or the effects of tear gas, right? And so that's why there was a, uh, a Ferguson to Palestine and Dream Defenders started to support Palestinians, they started to make trips there, right? So we see this cross, you know, this international movement with people of color identifying, uh, identifying like Black, Black Lives Matter also identified with um, the protectors at Standing Rock, right? So they came in and these people are seeing the similarities between their um, various things. Like look at Angela Davis, the, what, when, when we see them, we see us, right? There was a whole video there about like how black people in this country were seeing people being oppressed around the world and seeing themselves and their history, their contemporary, right? Uh, their contemporary um, uh, situations. So I think that there's a lot of room for that kind of anti-racist growth, right? Because anti-racist growth can also be internationalist, it can be also anti-colonial. Uh, hi. Hi, uh, Mayor. Thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. Um, I was look, you know, looking at your questions about how do we, this, especially the second and third, and so um, right now I'm, t I'm teaching medieval romance and race, and I'm teaching world lit. So one thing that I, I realized that I was failing at in my medieval romance and race class is that they, my students were struggling to see the connection between medieval romance and race. And, and what I realized is that before we even, you know, try to think about race in the way that we understand it now, I, I started to ask them, how does the text, what does the text normalize? What is made normal? How is the text, how does, how do these texts make whiteness, national, you know, medieval nationalisms, violence against Muslims normal? So that when you read it, the text makes you want to say, yeah, this is what Romans does, this is what it does. So I had, we had to start doing that, and I wish I had done that earlier in the class. And it wasn't until I started doing that that I don't think it got more fruitful as a class, and, and for me to help them as a, as a teacher. And, and so that's something that I think is not necessarily difficult, but is, a, is something that we need to start with. What is the normal, supposedly, in the literature? This, the second thing is, in my world literature class, uh, I don't teach any Western texts. Um, this, instead, the students have to do a presentation, a 15-minute presentation, and so they each present on one text, so the Odyssey, whatever, um, and so they only read one Western text for the whole class. Everything that we read as a class is non-Western, um, and that's really helped because I basically say, well, we're reading the best literature in the world, but you can read the, that stuff on your own. I don't care about that. And, and I think they really appreciated that. So I just basically completely decenter Western text from my world literature class. So 
that's how I've tried to do some of what you're asking us. Um, one good text that I teach, and it's problematic, so it also opens up for a lot of other kind of questions, is Amitav Ghosh's In an Antique Land, um, which is about Egypt and India in the 12th century, right? It's about the Geniza documents um, that are now being digitized. So it's actually a good way to teach also digital manuscript stuff, right? Because uh, at Cambridge, they're digitizing all of these uh, Judeo-Arabic um, manuscripts from Egypt. And uh, so you can see the, the archive that they've actually collected there from Cairo. But it's about um, the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean and this Afro-Asian bridge and how modern colonial, like both Egypt and India in the, in the you know, not really post-colonial, but like in the after the end of formal British colonialism, how um, an Indian, a, a, a British acad academic, a British Indian academic who's trained in anthropology is interacting with the local, um, the local Egyptian population, right? And what I mean by it's problematic, it was written in the 1980s, so it doesn't really take into account a whole lot of, like there's a lot of like, you know, kind of nostalgia for the past that, that is constructed, but it also, teaches too, and it opens up like how people think about uh, Egypt and these other, these other places. Um, because when my students think about Egypt, all they know is like King Tut and pyramids, right? Like, and the, the, like for them, that's the colonial, but that's the effect of colonialism, right? Like Egypt doesn't exist in the last 3,000 years for them, right? It's just an image. So I teach um, Timothy Mitchell's Colonizing Egypt, which is talking about the creation of or the recreation of Egyptian, the Egyptian image in world fairs. And like half of my students have been to Epcot so that they, they make the Im immediate, the immediate, they immediately go to like, you know, don't we do this about like other places too? And like, yeah, right? And then so it's a good way to teach about colonial um, imagery of these non-Western places. And then we have Hobby Lobby right down our street. So they were like actually like pilfering, right? Like Egyptian and Iraqi antiquities. So then they're like thinking about, oh, well, how do our, how do, how does like the UPenn uh, Art and Archaeology Museum get their stuff? Well, hmm, maybe, maybe we should start asking, right? Um, but that's a good way to do it. And then there's also Elia Kala's uh, Conflicted Antiquities, right? Which is about the kind of um, way in which, um, Western museums created the sense of antiquity, right, through these uh, artifacts. So it's a good way to teach about also the way in which Egypt had been by, by European colonists cut away from Africa, like it's not an African uh, uh, civilization, right? Um, so it gets into the, all of these kinds of questions that I think are central for us as medievalists to think about. We have time for like two more questions. Thank you so much for asking us to kind of think about questions of settler colonialism, both here and in Palestine, um, in terms of our questions of appropriation. And I just wanted to say in response to the teaching question, uh, I've been trying to think this through because I, my campus, I teach in San Antonio and the colonial history is very present. Um, my campus is on land that belonged to the Coaltecan people, but um, then was occupied by the Mission Espada, which enslaved indigenous people. And our students are primarily Latinx. And so I think like what I tried to think about is this, these kinds of histories you're talking about, but also how the teaching of canonical texts registers to like my students whose lives and communities have been so affected by histories of settler colonialism and to kind of center, I guess, the responses that they have and the kind of the cultural knowledges and languages and epistemologies that they can kind of like bring to the text. Like what is that, you know, kind of knowledge that, that they have? Yeah, I think that I think it's really important to, like, not necessarily like meet where the students are. Like, I want to challenge my students as well, but I want to challenge them in other ways, right? I don't want them to like think about, you know, learning medieval literature as kind of struggling to meet certain kinds of expectations about like what is Western civilization. Like, that's not what I want, right, out of my classes. And a lot of my students are not. Um, the, a lot of my students are South Asian or they're from the Arab world or they're, you know, um, or they have Mediterranean connections. 
Um, so teaching Mediterranean stuff, teaching Boccaccio in relation to Chaucer or something like that, like that could be also a way to, you know, um, to give the students like a sense that they have something in this, right? Because if you just teach like something like Beowulf, they, they don't necessarily, you know, connect to that in the same way. You know what I mean? So give them something to connect to. And then, um, and then you can draw them into other, other areas. So I think oh. this is uh, about your question about racial capitalism and areas of racism, white supremacy, and medieval studies. And Adam and I have talked about this already, and I want to bring up the Manchester University Beowulf volume. And I have already said on Twitter that I thought it was a form of settler colonial theft. Um, but this issue, in a larger way, is about, and this is a whole discussion of what Margot Hendricks talked about last time in terms of basically pre-modern race studies versus pre-modern critical race studies. But I would like, as the editor of LICO, to point out that one of the things Adam and I have discussed is the fact that it is very difficult to publish on pre-modern critical race studies because the ways in which these structures of white supremacy are laid out, at least in medieval studies, and I assume early modernists, also you guys, right, um, is that depending on what the editor has sent the article out to the reviewers, reviewers, unless they are very carefully selected because of their background in this area, cannot actually adequately review this material. And then so the constant gatekeeping happens. And I would also say even when there is something about writing about critical race in the pre-modern area that just panics people, even when one is carefully selecting. Um, I have not, I, I have made this, this I've, I've, I've told a couple of people um, a similar thing. I, there were two special issues that came out in the fall for me, one on um, trans medieval feminism and one on um, critical uh, race in the Middle Ages, right? They're both new topics. So I thought I would, I thought I had the same expectation of similar review issues. It's not. I did not have these issues when I did the medieval trans feminism issue um, in the way that I did when I had the critical race and Middle Ages issue. So there's something going on. And um, there is also something going on about an ongoing way where Adam's work on Beowulf and indigeneity spent multiple like journal, went through multiple journals that never gave him feedback, but still, you know, rejected it um, years ago. So this issue is an issue I think we need to discuss about how this racial capitalism operates in our field. Yeah, I just want to say it is coming out in post-medieval in um, summer. And like, I gave up on it, right? Like, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited about that, but at the same time, you know, yeah, that's kind of how careers get ruined, right? Like, you come, come up with like a good idea, like, and try to, try to test it out, but then it just gets, gets blocked. And I, and I will say, I will, I will really, really have to say here, like, I, my job got saved by my external reviewers because I got denied tenure the first time I went up because like the journals were holding on to the work and like it, they weren't giving me decisions. So, but, the, but my two reviewers who are awesome, amazing medievalists were like, this stuff is awesome. I don't know why it's not published. And my deans and my department listened to that and you know, they basically said, okay, like external reviewers said it's good. Why isn't it going in journals, you know, so they saved, you know, external reviewers saved, uh, my, my external dossier reviewers saved my job um, in that. And I, I, I'm lucky to work in a very humane uh, institution, right, that, that allows for that. I'm in a teaching heavy institution, so. Um, but I think that that's a, a very valid point, but that's something that we got to keep on pushing. Um, and, you know, Venues like this like certainly help, 
right? Ver venues like this are like gonna be crucial, not to me, I already have tenure, but like to all the untenured graduate students, like those are the people that we need to do this for, right? Um, so I wanna turn it back around to them at that point. Unfortunately, that takes us to time, so give Adam a huge round of applause. Thank you.